The Vampire of Sacramento, a necrophiliac, cannibal, blood drinker, and mutilator, Richard Trenton Chase could be the most deranged, warped, and brutal serial killer of all time. Join me in this tale of blood, devastation, and heartbreak. Let's profile this psychopath. Richard Trenton Chase was born May 23, 1950, in Santa Clara County, California. His upbringing and family life were, in some respects, ordinary, at least they were for the time. His parents were constantly fighting, which at times became physical. His father was a strict disciplinarian who would scold him for any wrongdoings. Richard later reported that both his parents beat him which, considering the views of 1950s parenting, was more than likely true. There is no evidence to suggest, however, that there was any severe child abuse, although, when a psychiatrist interviewed his mother, he described her as, quote, highly aggressive, hostile, and provocative. Richard was a well-behaved child with a normal IQ range, However, he displayed the McDonnell Triad, the three signs of early disturbance, bedwetting, animal cruelty, and pyromania. At just 10 years of age, Richard began killing many of his neighbours' pets, favouring cats. He would gut the animals and play with their insides. It was during these pet killings that he developed a taste for blood. He later reported that he would lick the blood off the knife that he had used to eviscerate the animals. Richard's early school life was ordinary, if unremarkable. He was an extremely quiet student and rarely joined in with the class, even when directly asked by his teachers. Despite this, he was still able to progress at the usual speed and did not seem to struggle with his schoolwork. He was also able to fit in with other students and had a good number of friendships. However, this soon changed when he began to drink alcohol, smoke weed and take LSD through high school. Towards the latter stages of high school, Richard grew rebellious and defiant, showing a complete lack of respect towards his teachers and fellow students. Any ambition or promise he had shown early on completely deserted him. Also, his room in the school dormitory was always in a complete state of disarray and at times squalor. By the end of high school, Richard realised that he was not like the other boys in his school. Although Richard was attracted to females, he could not achieve or maintain an erection around them. He dated several girls in high school but they never went further than the first date. One girl that he did take out later reported that he was unable to perform sexually as he could not keep an erection. Richard, dismayed at his impotence, went to a psychiatrist to find help. After assessing Richard, the doctor determined that Richard's erectile dysfunction was due to repressed anger. The repressed anger led to sexual frustration as he could not maintain a relationship. Richard left the appointment disheartened and angry. In Richard's warped thinking, he began to rationalise that if he ingested blood or injected it into his penis, it would work as a supplement and help him maintain an erection. As a result, he began to kill animals at a rapid pace, collecting their blood. When he obtained enough, he drank it in pints and tried to inject it directly into his penis. In his early 20s, Richard's behaviour and thoughts were becoming increasingly bizarre and concerning. He told anyone that he could that he believed his cranial bones had split apart. He said he shaved his head so that he could watch them move. 
he would also go to the emergency room several times, reporting that his stomach was upside down and that his pulmonary artery had been stolen and that he was being poisoned. In 1975, Richard injected himself with rabbit's blood, resulting in a severe case of blood poisoning. Doctors and social workers were so concerned with his behaviour that he was admitted to the Beverly Manor Psychiatric Hospital. During his stay at the hospital, Richard would catch any bird that he could find perched outside one of the many windows in the facility. Once he caught them, he would take them back to his room, pull their heads off and drink their blood. Because he was often found with blood smeared on his face and dripping from his mouth, the other inmates began to call Richard Dracula. Richard Chase now is doing uh, things with small animals, animals and birds, you know, killing them, drinking their blood. He needed extensive care. He was not receiving as much care as he should have gotten. Once, Richard was found extracting blood from the hospital therapy dog, which he then tried to inject into himself. Unbelievably, despite showing severe signs of disturbance and obviously a paranoid schizophrenic, Richard was put on a course of medication and released from the hospital within a year. He was deemed fit for release and so was sent to live with his mother. Against the wishes of the hospital staff, Richard's mother weaned her son off all the medication that he was taking. This was an incredibly dangerous and foolish thing to do. Richard had acquired a gun and was shooting neighbours' pets so that he could continue to drink blood. At one point, his mother caught her son ripping apart a cat. He had butchered it and was smearing its blood over his face. Rather than contact professionals, she told her son to get rid of the evidence. Before long, however, his mother got tired of caring for her son, so she found him his own apartment and sent him off on his own. Initially, Richard shared an apartment with friends. However, Richard had taken to walking around the apartment completely naked, even in company. His friends demanded that he move out, but when he refused, they all left instead. Once living completely alone, Richard began to bring animals back to the apartment. There, he killed them and consumed their blood and ate their organs. He believed animal blood would stop his heart shrinking and stop his blood turning to powder. In 1977, 200 miles from his home, Richard visited an Indian reservation called Pyramid Lake in Nevada. There, officers from the Bureau of Indian Affairs spotted his pickup truck stuck in the sand. When the officers opened up the truck, they made a shocking discovery. The truck was covered in blood, and there were two blood-streaked rifles inside. Worse still, there was a bucket containing blood and what appeared to be a liver. Rightfully concerned that a homicide had taken place, the officers scanned the area with binoculars looking for a culprit. They soon spotted a figure perched on a rock. The person, who was later identified as Richard Chase, was completely naked and covered in blood, and he ran off when he spotted the officers. Richard was soon cornered and arrested. When asked where the blood and liver had come from, Richard claimed it was his own, saying, quote, It's my own. It seeped out of me. Whilst in custody, the blood and liver were sent out for testing. The results proved them to have come from a cow. Richard was released without charge. Getting arrested did not deter Richard, nor did it stop his thirst for blood. Now, however, 
Richard would graduate to more serious gain. On December 29th, 1977, in the peaceful, middle-class suburb Robertson Avenue in Sacramento, shots rang out in the quiet afternoon. 51-year-old Ambrose Griffin was taking groceries into his home when he was struck by bullets. He fell to the ground dead, leaving his wife thinking he had just had a heart attack. It was soon apparent, however, that he had in fact been shot. When the police arrived at the scene, they did not find much evidence or any clues on what had happened. It was obvious that Ambrose had been killed in a drive-by shooting, but there was not a reason why it had happened. A background check on Mr. Griffin gave no leads. He had no enemies. Police surmised that it was probably kids shooting out streetlights and had accidentally hit the victim, or that it was a case of mistaken identity. When officers returned the following day, they discovered two spent shell casings out in the street. When officers combed the streets further along, they found more casings. It was apparent that the shooter had been shooting indiscriminately, aiming at random homes and establishments. Police had no idea that this random act of killing marked the start of a spree that would shock and appall America. Chase's first murder is somewhat abnormal and unique for serial killers. The large majority of serial killers are hands-on and personal, preferring to prolong the attack and gain satisfaction from the act. It is extremely rare for a serial killer, even at the start of their killing career, to commit a drive-by shooting. At the start of January 1978, Richard was again displaying puzzling and alarming behaviour. Residents of Sacramento's East Area had reported many cases of a prowler entering backyards and homes. At one residence, Richard was chased from the property after the owners caught chase, leaving the area when they returned home. When they entered their home, they found it an absolute wreck. Chase had seemingly ransacked the property, although nothing had been stolen. Bizarrely, they discovered that Chase had urinated in a drawer full of baby clothes and had defecated on the child's bed. When speaking on the psychology of a person that could do these things, Professor David Wilson said, quote, This is the behaviour of somebody who wants to utterly claim control over the particular house in which he has invaded. This is the behaviour of a man who is showing his contempt for the people who live there. Ultimately, he's not thinking clearly. He is not thinking rationally. On the 23rd of January, Chase struck again. Only this time, it would be no simple drive-by shooting. Police officers were advised of a homicide that had just taken place. They were told that the victim had been shot and that something had been done to her abdomen. Homicide chief Ray Biondi was the first to the scene at 2800 Tiogo Way, and right away he spotted what he thought of as a calling card. He found a spent 22 calibre shell in the family mailbox. He later said that nothing could have prepared him for what was waiting inside. When he stepped inside, he saw garbage scattered across the floor and there was an obvious bloody drag mark that went from the front room back into the master bedroom. There, he found 22-year-old Teresa Wallin. She had been shot in the head and had been badly mutilated. Her abdominal region had been cut open with a knife and her insides had begun to fall out of her body. Her clothing had been pulled over her chest and her legs were set apart, a sign of what officers assumed was a rape. It became apparent that Chase had moved Teresa's intestines and internal organs. Officers also discovered a used yoghurt container that Chase had used as a cup 
to drink the victim's blood from. It has also been reported that Chase had taken dog feces from the Wallin's yard and stuffed it down Teresa's throat. The murder was made even more tragic when officers discovered that Teresa was three months pregnant. An investigating officer would later comment that Teresa had absolute fear in her eyes, even after death. It was something that still haunted him decades later. Brutal murder scene showed signs of what the FBI had just recently begun classifying as a disorganized killing, which is a crime that would not be logical, reflects poor planning, and is committed by a disorganized killer. When speaking of the Teresa Wallin murder, Professor David Wilson said, quote, Here we've got the first human example of what Chase has been doing to animals for a very long period of time. Teresa Wallin was effectively mutilated. Her internal organs were removed, looked at, experimented with. But remember also, we have to go back to what we know about Chase from a very young age. He had erectile dysfunction, and therefore, whilst he might be sexually attracted to women, he can't express that sexual attraction in any way which is normal. So the way that it is manifesting itself is in relation to how badly abused her body is. He's curious about her internal organs. He's curious about her breasts. He's curious about her vagina. And of course, the way he expresses that curiosity is to desecrate and destroy. Forensic psychologist Dr. Helen Morrison would comment about Chase's MO in regards of mutilating his victim, saying, quote, It's a very similar characteristic among serial killers, and he's certainly not alone in this, in where they have no human emotions. So to them, a human being that they may have killed is just an object to be experimented upon, very similar to the laboratory animals that are used in experimentation. It seems to be almost a very unusual childlike curiosity. So the serial murderer frequently will treat his victims as if they were just a very experimental piece of meat. With a psychotic killer on the loose, detectives knew they needed to act fast. Officers went door to door to talk to everyone and anyone that may have seen something. One neighbour reported that he had seen a skinny white male in a bright orange coat cross his front porch towards Teresa Wallin's house. Chase's first victim had been shot from a distance and left where he fell. The murder and mutilation of Teresa Wallins signalled a dramatic escalation of violence. The following day, newspapers run the story of the murder and all its gory details. Everyone in the neighbourhood was rightly upset and angry, and there was much talk about buying guns for protection. An officer at the local police department contacted FBI coordinator Russ Vorpagel, who then contacted Robert Ressler, one of the top psychological profilers in Quantico. Ressler drew up a preliminary profile of the probable offender. His first assessment was incredibly accurate. It read, White male, aged 25 to 27 years, thin, undernourished appearance. Residents will be extremely slovenly, and unkempt, an evidence of the crime will be found at the residence, history of mental illness, and will have been involved in the use of drugs, will be a loner who does not associate with either males or females, and will probably spend a great deal of time in his own home where he lives alone, unemployed, possibly receive some form of disability money, if residing with anyone, it would be parents, however, this is unlikely. No prior military record, high school or college dropout, probably suffering from one or more forms of paranoid psychosis. 
Officers were encouraged when they received the report, hoping it would help them catch the killer before he struck again. What the officers and the neighbourhood as a whole did not realise was that Richard Chase was about to strike again, and this time with even more savagery. A large task force had been mobilised in a desperate race to apprehend the killer, but before the investigation could even begin, Homicide Chief Ray Biondi received the call that three more bodies had just been found. Detectives arrived at Marywood Drive, Sacramento, and it was quickly obvious that this scene was very similar to that of Teresa Walling's murder. In the front room, officers found Daniel Meredith, 51, who had been shot execution style. Officers searched a back bedroom where they found 38-year-old Evelyn Moroth. She had been badly mutilated and some of her internal organs had been removed. Around the side of the bed, they found Evelyn's five-year-old son, Jason. He had been shot in the head. In the bathroom, the bathtub was full of bloody water that had brain tissue and fecal matter floating in it. There were many similarities between this murder and that of Teresa Wallings, such as how both females had been shot and later mutilated, both had had some of their internal organs removed and played with, and officers found 22 calibre shells at both scenes. There was one difference with this murder, however. Evelyn Moroth had been sodomized. As a young man, Richard had struggled with sexual relations, but here, that appeared to have changed. Dr. Helen Morrison would say, quote, Erectile dysfunction is not unusual among serial killers, although they are capable very frequently of having some sexual intercourse when the victim is dead. Professor David Wilson, when talking about this aspect of Richard Chase, said, quote, Some serial killers will be act-focused, other serial killers will be processed-focused. By act-focus, I mean that the psychological need for the killer to kill is achieved simply by the death of the victim. The killer will do nothing to the victim's body because he's achieved what it is that he wants to achieve. On the other hand, a processed focused serial killer will want to spend time with the body of his victim, and that's very common in relation to what Chase did with Teresa Wallen and what he would do with Evelyn Moroth. He wants to explore the body, he wants to drink her blood, he wants to engage with the body in a sexual way, and the longer he's able to stay with the victim, the longer he's able to sustain some feeling of sexual satisfaction. As horrendous as this murder was, officers received information that made it so much worse. They became aware that a 22-month-old baby, David Ferreira, had been in the house, but now he was nowhere to be found. Police quickly mobilised with volunteers from the community in an effort to find the infant because of the random nature of the killing, there were few clues. The FBI and all other officers understood that most serial killers do not commit random killings. Serial killers usually have a pattern when picking victims. This killer seemed to kill indiscriminately. Men, women and children. When the police began to canvass the neighbourhood, they realised that many people had spotted the killer. They all told officers that they saw a white male, around six feet tall, wearing a bright orange parka coat, very scraggly hair, thin, very emaciated looking, who would peer into people's homes. Despite having a good visual description of their suspect, officers were having difficulty identifying him. The issue was, there had been hundreds of sightings of white men, in their twenties, with long hair, as an awful lot of men fit that description at the time. When detectives began to feel the case slipping through their fingers, they finally caught a break. Nancy Holden, a girl who had been at high school with Richard Chase, 
contacted police after she saw an artist's sketch of the suspect. She remembered an encounter that she had had at the town and country shopping centre on the day of Teresa Walling's murder. She had seen a scruffy thin man and was shocked by his appearance, calling him, quote, dishevelled, cadaverously thin, bloody sweatshirt, yellow crust around his mouth and sunken eyes. She didn't recognise him and turned in the opposite direction hoping to put distance between them. Suddenly, the man approached her and asked, quote, Were you on the motorcycle when Kurt was killed? This is regarding a young man who attended school with them who was killed on a motorcycle. She had indeed dated someone named Kurt in high school who had been killed on a bike. She asked him who he was and he had replied that he was Rick Chase. He scared her so badly that she ran to her car, locked the doors and drove away as quickly as possible. She didn't think any more of it until she saw the police sketch and knew it was the same man. Officers interviewed Nancy and she described his jacket, which she said was an orange coloured snow coat, the same as the jacket worn by the person who walked past a neighbour's house towards Teresa Wallin's house. Nancy also told police that she was positive that there was blood on Richard's hands. A background check on Richard Trenton Chase revealed his previous run-ins with the law, including the strange incident at Pyramid Lake. The background check also provided officers with an address. Three police officers quickly set off towards the home of the person that they believed had murdered five and kidnapped a baby. When they arrived at the apartment complex, they parked outside and found the building manager. She confirmed that Richard Trenton Chase was in apartment 15. The officers went and knocked on the door, but there was no response. They kept trying, but had no luck. They soon realised that there was a vacant apartment next door to Chase's. They went inside and listened up against the wall. They could clearly hear movement inside apartment 15. The officers did not have a warrant for apartment 15, nor did they even have an arrest warrant. An officer telephoned their supervisor, Ray Biondi, and asked him for some advice. As they waited for word back from their chief, they took up new positions around the complex. Chase, after waiting a while, took the silence outside to mean that the police had given up their search. Before long, Richard left his apartment. He quickly spotted an officer and started to run. As he was looking back toward the chasing officer, Richard never saw the other policeman waiting for him. When Chase reached the other policeman, the officer hit him in the face, knocking Chase to the ground. The three officers jumped on their suspect and began to wrestle with him. They knew this man was a murderer, and they could also see that he was armed. His gun was in a holster across his chest. One officer pulled out his own gun, stuck it in Chase's ear, and said, quote, Quit fighting, or I'm going to blow your brains out. Chase did not immediately surrender, but detectives managed to finally overpower their suspect without a shot being fired. Once they had Chase handcuffed and secured, the officers entered apartment 15, hoping to find the missing baby alive. When they got inside, they found that almost every surface in the apartment was covered with blood. The couch was covered, the kitchen counters, the sink, the bathtub, the toilet, carpets, everywhere. They also found strange looking substances in food mixers, which turned out to be human blood, human organs and Coca-Cola mixed together. There were also jars in the refrigerator that contained organs and one dish that contained brain tissue, but the missing infant was nowhere to be found. The arresting officer was the first to interrogate Chase, where Richard admitted to killing dogs and other animals. The detective used every trick in the book but Chase never admitted killing people and the officer failed to get a confession or information on the whereabouts of David Ferreira. 
Prosecuting attorney Ronald Tochterman had joined detectives in the next wave of interrogations. He later reflected, saying, Some of his responses suggested that he was delusional, saying that people were out to get him. He might have mentioned the Nazis or the Italians. They were recurring things. When he was advised, he said he wanted an attorney, and I remember that I intervened. I said, well, theoretically, he has the right to refuse to answer. We were supposed to stop questioning him at this point, but I'm going to persist because at that point the baby was still unfound. We still didn't know where the baby was. So I did question him, but he would not acknowledge anything. He was not forthcoming at all. Chase did not reveal where the baby was, but almost two months later, officers finally discovered where the boy was. The boy was found outside the Arcade Wesleyan Church, which was less than one mile from Chase's apartment. The caretaker of the church had discovered the boy's body in a cardboard box in the small alley between the church and another building. David Ferreira's body was badly decomposed and he had been decapitated. The head was inside the box with the body. In 1979, Richard Trenton Chase was tried for his crimes. Feelings against Chase ran so high and volatile that the trial was held outside of Sacramento in San Jose. Defense attorney Ferris Salome entered a plea of insanity. He would later say, quote, The whole case with Richard Chase was one of mental disease. He was about 27 or 8 years of age when I met him at the jail. That was a day or two at the most after he was arrested. I got the opinion very soon, I don't know how quickly, that he's the most deranged fellow I had ever met. The prosecution, however, were confident that Chase would be found guilty. They believed that Chase obviously knew right from wrong when he had committed the murders, and so he was technically sane in the eyes of California law. Prosecutor Ronald Tochterman later said, quote, The stuff that was found in his house was very, very incriminating, and I remember approaching the trial with the idea that it wasn't going to be much of a challenge to convince a jury that he was the one who had killed these people. The challenge was going to be to convince them that he was legally sane when he killed the people, and then, ultimately, when we got to the penalty phase, that the appropriate punishment was death. When Chase took to the stand, he admitted to drinking the victim's blood and admitted that he had decapitated the infant in order to obtain more blood to drink. He stated that he thought decapitating the boy and consuming his blood would be therapeutic. Richard ended his time on the stand by describing himself as, quote, a good person, although weak, in heart and mind. To be found insane, it must be clear that the person does not know the nature of what they've done, that the person does not understand the nature of their offence, and cannot distinguish right from wrong. The large majority of serial killers who commit the most horrendous crimes understand that what they are doing is wrong but the general public often believe that a person capable of murder must be insane, that it takes insanity to allow a person to murder and mutilate women and children, but most often the murderer is cruel but sane. Prosecutor Ronald Tochterman would say, quote, He did a lot to cover up his crimes. He did a lot to prevent the police from finding him. He denied having killed the victims when he was confronted, all of which suggested that he knew what he had done was wrong, and there were a lot of other things that suggested that as well. However, defence attorney Ferris Salome would say, quote, Chase did a lot of things which the prosecution will tell you that shows he was thinking, like he took rubber gloves to protect himself, but on the other hand, he had never cleaned himself up. People saw this blood on him all the time. He never got a haircut. He went in and out of people's yards. 
he never seemed to be trying to conceal his appearance. Would the jury judge him not guilty by reason of insanity, or would they find him guilty? The difference would mean life or death. In May 1979, they would deliver their verdict. Richard Trenton Chase was found guilty on six counts of first-degree murder and was sentenced to die in the gas chamber. Chase was taken to San Quentin Prison, where he was placed on condemned row. On December 26, 1980, Richard was found dead in his prison cell. An autopsy revealed that he had committed suicide by taking an overdose of his prescribed medication, which he had been secretly storing away. But with Richard Chase dead, questions were left unanswered. Questions such as, what had driven him to commit such appalling crimes? Was he a born killer? Or had something in his childhood and upbringing turned him into one? Forensic psychologist Dr. Michael Stone said, quote, If he was abused at all, it may have been his father with the belt for some of his outrageous actions. However, I would have to say that that wouldn't make somebody crazy. The truly brutalised young people who suffer real cruelty and consistent humiliation, all of those things are very important factors nudging the person in the direction of later violence for crime, but you don't make somebody schizophrenic that way. So, if Richard Chase had not suffered from serious childhood abuse, could his future as a serial killer be rooted in childhood neglect? Dr. Michael Stone continued, saying, quote, What was striking to me about Chase's mother is that one time he knocked on her door, or she heard a noise or something, and there he was, he was holding a dead cat, and blood was smeared all over his face, and she didn't do anything. Professor David Wilson would give his opinion on the matter, saying, quote, This man was a schizophrenic, a paranoid schizophrenic, and I feel it's a tragedy that he wasn't given the help that would have stopped him from killing other fellow human beings. I think once you are beginning to torture animals on a regular basis, then simply you're learning that for yourself, that you are able to do this. You become desensitized to the pain that another sentient being has at your hands. And therefore, you become socialized into imagining that how you are behaving is acceptable behavior. It is but a short step to then feel that they are able to engage in the same types of behavior not with animals, but with other human beings. Dr. Michael Stone would summarize the story of Richard Chase by saying, quote, I think the best way to understand Chase from a diagnostic standpoint is that he was a schizophrenic and that he suffered serious breakdown in adolescence because of the aggravation of his genetic potential by these, as we say, psychomedical or hallucinogenic drugs. Whatever the reason was that made Richard Trenton Chase kill will never be fully understood. It may not have even been understood completely by Richard himself. Whatever the reason, it will not change the fact that six people lost their lives and many, many more were affected from his actions. If I give my own honest opinion, and I must state I am not a qualified psychologist or medically trained in any way, but I believe Richard Chase was severely mentally disturbed and probably did not completely understand what he was doing or why he was doing it. I do believe that he knew it was wrong to murder people, but I think that his schizophrenia and other mental illnesses meant that he could not stop himself from acting against what his delusional mind was telling him to do. In short, I believe he knew what he was doing, but was unable to stop himself from doing it. That said, at the very least, he should have been institutionalised for the rest of his life. I cannot say with 100% conviction that I believe he should have been given the death penalty.
What do you believe made him do it? Was he mad or was he bad? Let me know in the comments below. And thank you all again for joining me on another video. I hope you enjoyed it. And until next time, long days and pleasant nights.